Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, I'm so excited to be here. I wished it could be in person. Um, I have such a heart for um, student midwives and all those that are developing and growing within our midwifery family. For those who are in schools thinking about a career in midwifery, for those who are on the journey, for those who have completed the journey, what we do, what we absolutely do, will ripple through generations. Our contact, our narrative counts. And I'm sure many student midwives have heard your midwifery lecturers talk about the fact that what you do will ripple through generations. There are not many professions that can say that. So um, hello, good afternoon to you all. My name's um, Jacqueline Dunkley-Bent and I'm the Chief Midwifery Officer for the NHS in England. So I'm going to move on to the next slide. I just want to say, first of all, before I do anything, I'd like to say thank you. Thank you to you. Thank you to your universities, to the lecturers, to the uh, um, uh, clinical academics, all those people that are supporting supporting you in this space. Your growth is significant. We need you to, to graduate, to join the qualified uh, midwifery family. Um, so a huge thank you. It hasn't been easy during the pandemic. I know it hasn't. For some of you, um, your year two may, may well have been disrupted. Your year three may well have been disrupted in terms of the pandemic. Um, so I just want to say a huge thank you. We have moved forward against the backdrop of fear, against the backdrop of being anxious, being worried, um, all, all manner of feelings culminating in one. Um, I just wanted to show this slide because I just wanted to show you that as the Chief Midwifery Officer, whilst I'm advising at lofty heights and supporting policy and everything else and being a leader um, for our services in England, I also work clinically. So this is me donned on a clinical shift, um, starting at the beginning and going way beyond the end um, because this particular shift was a, a water birth in PPE. So I just want you to know that um, I truly believe that to be an authentic leader, I have to walk and step in your shoes. And that's why I frequent uh, clinical practice to do that. So thank you. Thank you for everything that you have done, that you're doing now and that you will continue to do going forward. On to the next slide. So I just want to share with you a few um, uh, items about my ambition as a Chief Midwifery Officer. And the over, over, uh, overriding ambition is that England is the safest place in the world to be pregnant, birth and transition into parenthood. Also, uh, to have a workforce that feels valued, so important, respected and invested in. So that's my overall ambition for maternity care provision in England. And those tables at the bottom, how are we going to achieve um, uh, that ambition? Um, and it, it's a dynamic process, I think. But first of all, I will say that we need to build capacity within midwifery leadership at a national level, regional level and local level. What I will say, despite all the challenges of the past two years and we're still in the challenge because we have winter to come we have gained momentum with developing a career framework for you so that you might one day aspire to be so we have at the moment um, I have uh, two deputy chief midwifery officers there are seven regional chief midwives so for those of you that don't know England is split into seven NHS regions and we have a regional chief midwife in each region who has a deputy chief midwife. They've just come on board in recent weeks. And there is a regional obstetrician that will contribute to that portfolio, not full time, but part time. So at a regional level, there's a regional chief midwife, a deputy and a regional obstetrician. And um, so that's just a little example of how we've been growing the infrastructure to provide good leadership for our services. 
in my office at a national level, we have a, a researcher, a midwife um, called, uh, well, she needs no introduction, P Professor Jane Sandal, who is the um, uh, um, head of uh, midwifery and maternity research at NHS England Improvement. We also have Wendy Oleyewola, who is the national inequality lead um, for uh, NHS England, leading on maternity from a woman's perspective, a user's perspective, women and people perspective, and also a staff perspective. And of course, um, we have Jules Goodgen, who is a joint appointment between my office and NHS Dig Digital to lead on digital maternity. So that's just a little example of building an infrastructure, but we also are in the place of um, uh, supporting heads and directors of midwifery, and other aspirant leaders. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about them later. But the second building block is about improving perceptions. And don't we need to improve the perceptions of our amazing profession, least of all to the public and the press? I get a little bit tired of negative headlines about maternity when I can see the amazing work that's being done to care for and to support women and their families um, uh, on their birthing journey. And naturally, it goes without saying quality and safety. Everything that we're doing is predicated by that quality and safety agenda. So moving on to the next slide. Now, that was my, they are still, that is still my ambition, of course it is. But who would have thought that on the 30th of January 2020, this was going to land on our doorsteps? And on the 11th of March, we enter into territory that nobody has, well, I've never entered that kind of territory in the course of my lifetime and my working life in the NHS. And you have felt it like I have. Too. And sadly, we've lost some midwives along the way, and we've lost women along, pregnant women and people along the way too. Everybody gets scared some of the times. I've been scared too. But together, it creates a different picture. So, on to the next slide, on to the challenges. So, we've had many challenges. And I've shared a few of them already with you, uh, that the pandemic was announced and that meant that we had um, sickness because of the pandemic. We had uh, 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 people, the people that were shielding. Um, we had and still are having death, the fear. We had to suspend some of our services. Home birth services were suspended. Midwifery-led services were suspended. And some freestanding midwifery units uh, temporarily closed their doors. And that meant that, sadly, many women lost choice of place of birth. But the overwhelming um, ambition was to keep people safe. So we had to pull staff together. It was the only way, and I trust our leaders implicitly with how they've managed that process. We had to deal with the headlines of the visiting restrictions. Some of you may well remember the Mail on Sunday, um, seven weeks of negative press about us not allowing visitors in maternity services. And actually, the truth is, is, is that every woman was able to have their partner or their husband uh, or every uh, um, uh, uh, everybody, regardless of um, whether they were female or identified as female or not, were allowed to have their partners with them during um, established labour. And then in more recent times, visiting restrictions have been lifted, but the headlines were not kind. Uh, we had to suspend and change our trajectories for the MTP, which is the Maternity Transformation Programme, the vehicle that's delivering the Better Births report. We had to change some of our ch um, ambitions with regard to the long term plan, particularly the mental health provision and the pelvic health provision. They're two key items that I lead on that will really help in terms of women's health 
and perinatal mental health. Uh, many of us were working clinically. We, In the middle of all that, I had to give evidence along with Matthew Jolly, the National Clinical Director to the Health and Social Care Committee, um, who were undertaking an inquiry into maternity safety. We had to give evidence twice and then a third time to their specialist committee in, against the backdrop of the Afghani, um, Afghanistan resettlement program, where we had pr uh, pregnant women from Afghanistan that we had to support and continue to support is the right thing to do. We had the fuel crises where community midwives were struggling with diesel and that's against the backdrop of the vaccine hesitancy, the conspiracy theories, etc, etc. I could go on and I'll speak to you a little bit about vaccinations as we progress. And we have winter and flu. But despite all that, you know, we are doing, you are doing a, a, a phenomenal job at supporting women, people, babies and their families right now in this space. On to the next slide. We have challenges in relation to inequality um, and this is no news to many of you. So if we can just point to the fact that maternal mortality, um, yes, we are doing better. However, Rates are high for black mixed ethnicity and Asian uh, women stillbirths. Uh, we're doing well in, in terms of our reduction to meet the 2025 ambition, uh, but we need to work harder for these groups that you can see here. Neonatal mortality, we're doing well, but rates are high and increasing for black and Asian babies. So we have much to do, and we are doing much in this space despite the pandemic. On to the next slide. And just a moment of pause. You may well have seen this already, but it's really, really important to know the difference between the two. And with regard to equity, that's the space that we want to be in. We want everybody to have the same outcomes as those who have the best outcomes and experiences. So to achieve that, we need to do something a little bit differently. And look at that little one in the purple jersey on the right. We are doing something differently in England for women who experience the worst outcomes. And I'll share a little bit more shortly. Next slide. So this is taken directly from UCOS. You can find this on the Embrace uh, website. Just have a look at the, uh, the figure of the woman um, on the right. So first wave, we had uh, nine women uh, that died as a result of COVID. Second wave increased to 11 and we continue to increase. We only had the JCVI authorised vaccinations for pregnant women in spring this year. So we are catching up and we have a lot to do. But we know that the Delta variant um, uh, is quite challenging for pregnant women, in the, particularly in the third trimester. And we have evidence from the UCOS that shows that in a cohort sample of um, 171 women at one point, all um, were... 171 women pregnant in hospital, uh, sick um, with the Delta variant, all but three had not been vaccinated. And of the three that were vaccinated, they'd only received a single vaccine. So the point we're making is the majority of women in hospital pregnant on ECMO um, have not had a vaccine, which gives some credence to the fact that the vaccine provides protective effect for pregnant mums and their babies and, and people. And therefore, we are encouraging uh, women to have an informed conversation about vaccine uptake so that they can make an informed decision following the JCVI guidance and indeed the Royal College of Obstetrics and Gynaecology guidance. On to the next slide. Globally, again, I'm cantering around the world here in, in the pandemic. Globally, of course, we have much to do. And I just want you as students just to be mindful that, that for every challenge and problem we have here, just have a look at the global picture. Progress has been uneven to many. Um, um, and they're still being left behind. We have on... Uh, 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 circa 810 maternal deaths every day and one stillbirth every 16 seconds. 2.4 million newborn 
deaths each year. And one in five women give birth without one of you. So I know this is relative, but every life, wherever they happen to be, is significant, is absolutely significant. So we have much to do, not just here, but globally. Are we challenged here? Yes, we are. And we I've shown you data with regards to the inequality piece. Have a look further afield. We have much to do. And on to the next slide. This is really a moment of pause and reflection. And all of you, as you're forging your way in terms of your um, student uh, midwifery career, thinking about what you'd like to do when you qualify, some of you may well end up in other countries supporting. I frequent um, uh, international travel. This is um, at a conference in Abuja uh, in West Africa. And uh, I was supporting qualified midwives on their CPD journey. And I know that quote from Mary Angelo, absolutely. There's something about how we make people feel. The stuff that you do every day, every time you make contact with a woman, with a person, with babies and their families. There is something about how you make them feel that is remembered. So on to the next slide. What are we doing with all of the above? What have we done? You know, I, I could spend an awful lot of time going into detail, but you can see here we have been responsive um, to uh, uh, women and their families. One of the most um, one of the um, most challenging uh, things about the pandemic for me as CMIDO was the negative narrative about maternity and women staying away because they were fearful. So um, that meant that when they engaged with maternity services, sometimes, you know, there was fetal demise, it was too late and the outcomes were not what one would have expected. So really, really important to step in that space of engaging with women, encouraging them to join with us and receive uh, maternity care. The four point plan that you can see there, I think it's bullet point um, number five or, or six. Uh, this four point plan was really to try and reach out to those who have the worst outcomes and encourage them through their healthcare professionals, through you, through the midwives, to support them in a different way, lower the threshold for referral and treatment. Um, so moving on to the next slide. What are we doing in this space for you, for us, for our people, for our family at this challenging time, despite the negativity, despite the concerns and complaints from every single platform I can imagine and think of, my Viber, my WhatsApp, my LinkedIn direct message, Twitter direct message, um, ordinary message, email, voicemail, all full with concerns, um, challenges. And I will say to you that this is a snapshot um, of what we are doing for our family, for our services, and of course, the previous slide for women, people, babies and their families. So funding has been distributed now. We put in a bid, a 95 million pound bid, and we, um, to NHS England, and that bought us 1,200 more midwives that are currently being recruited, 100 obstetricians, uh, backfill for MDT training, 52 million pounds, that wasn't a part of the bid, but we've got additional monies, 52 million pounds for digital maturity. The international recruitment is going well. We have 400 applications are being processed and I think 18 offers, one eight offers have been made, but 400 applications are being processed. This takes time. There is a moral challenge. I know there is about going into other countries and, and inviting midwives to work here, but many of these midwives have not got jobs and cannot provide for their families. We're working on retention, looking at preceptorship for you. So when you qualify, is there consistency in preceptorship across our maternity services? We're also working with partners to address morale concerns in midwifery. We have to raise the morale as leaders for those leaders that are on are listening today. Um, we cannot join in, and I know you know this, um, and you'd stand with me in solidarity. We cannot walk around being all morose 
saying this is dreadful. Leading people means that we have to lead with passion and authenticity and do what's right. And doing what's right means that we are um, working with partners to raise that morale. Um, the March for Midwives, the closed Facebook pages, the change.org petition, all these people are now supporting us, supporting me in that attrition piece, where also funding, we have funded services with Band 7 Midwives to help uh, provide some pastoral support for newly qualified midwives and also help with the attrition piece, also supporting the return to practice midwives. So I've asked services, find out where your retirees are and invite them back. Let's not rob Peter to pay Paul by finding a band seven within your service. Let's go externally and see if our retirees will come back and provide some pastoral support. We, in recent times, we've worked up a spec. This will be going out to NHS services any day soon to provide additional PMO program management support for our heads directors of midwifery. So they have time to think and B. Also, we are supporting recruitment of maternity support workers. We're going to be funding that. That letter is going to be going out soon and also supporting their um, uh, uh, orientation and induction. And lastly, for all the professional midwifery advocates out in our system, we've got 800 in England and we need more, I know. Thank you to them because they are really working hard to raise the morale. They're deploying restorative clinical supervision uh, to really help in that psychological space. And in turn, we are training more and we are offering a psychological boost to all our 800 PMAs in England so that they can offer it to you. And that's just the start of a 10. But moving on very quickly, we have to stay focused. Of course we do. And for that reason, we are looking at how we can continue with our national ambitions. We published continuity of care guidance a few weeks ago. And we have listened to what everybody has said about the unintended consequences. So this guidance starts by saying, we cannot have further rollout of continuity of carer until we have safe staffing in place, engagement with staff and education of staff. They're three key building blocks. So for everybody that's worried and concerned, these are the building blocks that need to be in place before further rollout. But this ambition will not go away. Why? Because it saves lives and it's the right thing to do. On to the next slide. So, um, oh, that was on to the next slide. So I just would like to say to you, um, and I'm nearly finishing, and I'm just going to take a moment to pause. This quote I have remembered most days in the last two years. You know that um, Kamala Harris was the 49th president, a vice, a vice president of the United States. She says, and I, I resonate on this most days, my daily challenge to myself is to be part of the solution, to be a joyful warrior in the battle for the soul of the country. And I, I add the battle for the soul of our profession, our midwifery profession. The battle will not stop. My challenge to you is to join that effort. Let's not throw up our hands and there are many throwing up of hands at the moment, when it's time to roll up our sleeves. Because years from now, this moment will pass. It has to pass. And our children, our grandchildren, if you haven't got them and you don't want to ever have them, your friend's children, um, your family's children, grandchildren, they will ask us where we were when the stakes were so high. They will ask us what it was like. And I don't just want to tell them how we felt. I want to tell them what we did. Really important. Let's not throw up our hands. Let's join and roll up our sleeves. So my final slide to you. My final slide to you. This is our time. I started by saying what we do ripples through generations. The environment in the womb now 
will influence whether that person, when they're an adult, will have coronary artery disease. Look up Barker's work if you don't know that work. What we do and say will ripple through generations. So it's our time now. And for every student midwife that's listening, junior or senior, do we do nothing? Do we do little? Do we do our best or do what's right? And from where I'm sitting, I think that we are being our best, we are doing our best, and we are absolutely doing what's right. Thank you.